who likes to get a bone marrow biopsy done? <laughs> Nobody. I always tell my fellows um, that, uh, you know, if you can figure out a way to do all of this testing uh, without uh, doing the test itself, uh, you will be a very, very wealthy individual and will, s more importantly, make many, many people very, very happy. Um, as my mentor, uh, Richard Shattuck, once said, uh, you got to go to the source. You know, as fellows, we always uh, figured out ways to, you know, we'd feel badly putting somebody through the procedure. Uh, you know, well, maybe we can do this. or Go to the source. Go to the source. And, and so, uh, you know, you got to go to the source. And let's talk about it. I try to simple, uh, make this as simple as possible. But I do want to talk about what we do with the information. Why is it so important that we do the bone marrow biopsy and aspirate? And what information do we get from it? And how does it direct your care? Uh, not only you know, your diagnosis, uh, but very, very importantly, what we're learning uh, with all of these diagnostic tools, which is going to be the crux, uh, much of which uh, is going to be discussed uh, by, by Dr. Gottlieb uh, here in a, in a few moments. Uh, what does it mean for you prognostically? And is it going to alter therapy downstream? And I think we're getting closer to that, that uh, era. You know, we, we used to talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, personalized medicine, and the reality is we're really getting there. And I, I so enjoyed um, uh, Dr. Mesa's talk um, and, and the fact that, you know, he mentioned what might be right for you might not be right for somebody else. And that is that has more to do with... Uh, with, with your quality of life, with which symptoms there are, how many symptoms, the depth of symptoms, but th the people that you bring with you. And what I want to show you now as well is even on a molecular level, we can use all of this information to come up with a model of who you are as an individual, not just the disease, but what you bring to the table and how we can better, uh, better treat that. And I think that era is very much upon us. Uh, thanks be to God. So just step back, what, why is this such an important test? Well, we know that the bone marrow is the organ that makes cells, makes the blood cells uh, that float through, course through our body uh, for, uh, and do, do a variety of things. I think it's always very, very helpful to sort of go back to the basics uh, before we go into the more, uh, more complex and how it relates to disease. Um, but before we can understand disease, we need to understand basic uh, biology and physiology. Um, and, and so what I have here, um, is just a slide that very simply depicts some of the cells uh, that are ultimately affected in patients with myeloproliferative disease and, and other uh, uh, bone marrow hematopoietic type disorders. Um, and as you can see, the bone itself, and this is sort of a crude diagram, but uh, shows you uh, the cortex, the part that keeps our bones nice and strong, keeps us from uh, falling apart, if you will. And then inside uh, that, that cortex is the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is comprised of different things. And we're going to talk about what some of those different things are. Um, there's a stroma that's very important. Um, I like to think of the stroma as sort of the soil uh, of the bone marrow that communicates with the cells that are coursing uh, therein in the bone marrow space. Some of those uh, are depicted here, the hematopoietic stem cell. This is a cell that has been programmed to essentially turn into the various parts of the blood. Red blood cells carry oxygen, of course, platelets to stop us from bleeding, and a variety of different white cells, which are largely meant to fight uh, various types of infections and other insults on the body. Um, so these cells have sort of uh, are, are pre-programmed to go in a certain direction. Okay, when we do bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant, these are the types of cells that we are harvesting and ultimately reinfusing into uh, the patient in hopes that these cells, which were perhaps mutated previously uh, in the diseased marrow, uh, will now be able to do their job and mature normally. Uh, because ultimately what they're going to become, and everybody's familiar with the term blast, right? Uh, because one of the things we're worried about is, is the blast count going up uh, as it relates to progression of disease and potentially um, evolution into acute leukemia. Um, but that blast cell really has a job in life, and that job in life is to mature. It is to mature into the healthy components, the mature aspects of, of blood. Again, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And sometimes those cells get stuck at a point of differentiation or of maturation, uh, and they, they divide. They become a clone. Uh, and what we see are various points of clonality uh, 
or, or you know, you think of Star Wars, right? These, uh, these, these clones, these little, little guys which are running about unchecked in patients with MPN eventually uh, leading to a rise in, uh, particular, in one cell line in particular, oftentimes as uh, uh, resulting in a demise of the normal production of cells otherwise, and we're gonna talk about that more uh, as well. And then the stroma, interestingly, um, has some other uh, potential impact, which is why we're starting to explore the stroma and cells from within the stroma for other types of, of uh, stem cell therapy, um, uh, through, which is a, a topic for another talk, but nevertheless, um, exciting uh, stuff uh, to think about. So. Uh, we talked about those hematopoietic stem cells, um, and in the case of myeloproliferative disease, you can see that there are something called myeloid stem cells, and those are the stem cells whoops, that become impacted um, in patients uh, or loved ones uh, represented here in this room. Uh, and so these myeloid stem cells can turn into megakaryoblasts or megakaryocytes, which are platelet factories. And uh, as you know, this is uh, the pathway that is oftentimes affected in ET, but also there are crossover syndromes, as I'm sure you've heard about uh, earlier. Uh, but any number of these mature cell lines uh, from this point toward, the, toward your left uh, can be affected in patients with myeloproliferative disease. And there are pathways all along the course uh, from the stem cell uh, uh, state onward uh, which can be defective, resulting in elevated, uh, elevated counts, um, which are all listed here. <clears throat> So why do we do the bone marrow biopsy in aspirin? It's not just for myeloproliferative disease, as you can well imagine. There are a multitude of reasons why we would do it. Um, certainly if somebody has abnormal blood counts. Now, um, you know, I oftentimes get, well, my, my spouse or my child had, uh, you know, anemia or one cell line affected. If there's another reason, you don't necessarily need a blood test. However, for most of us as hematologists, the general rule of thumb is if you have an, a, an unexplained isolated cytopenia, that's a reason, or a low blood count, uh, high or low, I should say. Um, but if you have two abnormal cell lines, that's usually of greater concerns. That suggests that the, there's a problem in the bone marrow itself uh, rather than later on uh, for the most part. And that's something that we need to uh, uh, explore. And again, you gotta go to the source, unfortunately, for, uh, for those of you who have had this procedure done. So suspicion for hematological malignancy naturally would be another reason. Fever of unknown origin. We can see certain infections in the marrow that we might not see elsewhere, have adequate ways of testing. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, uh, fever, uh, whether it be from infection or even blood disorders, um, it, certainly many of you, I'm sure, know that uh, patients with myeloproliferative disease occasionally have fever uh, that is unexplained, or symptoms, again, as, as Dr. Mesa suggested, related to, uh, to inflammation. Uh, so that would be another reason. Storage disorders, metastatic cancer, very importantly. Um, if somebody comes into me and they have abnormal blood counts and a history of breast cancer uh, in a female or perhaps uh, um, or male, uh, but a prostate cancer in a, in, in a male, we worry that perhaps that cancer has recurred and has invaded the marrow space. And actually, this is something that can occasionally look like myeloproliferative disease. Um, and so it's something we always uh, exclude as well. Deficiency states. Our iron testing is, is very good, but it's not perfect from the blood. Uh, so this is, the, the bone marrow is still the gold standard test for assessing iron status, and I'm gonna talk more about that because I do think it has implication in he hematological diseases we'll talk about in, in, uh, in just a minute. Marrow toxicity, very importantly. Uh, so this is somebody perhaps that took a certain medication and now all of a sudden has abnormal blood counts uh, and they, they come in and the only way to know for sure whether it's that medication, perhaps the medication has been withdrawn, but sometimes the, the marrow may take weeks to recover or even months, uh, what we might do in that scenario is check the marrow and if the marrow is eventually, uh, eventually uh, um, essentially uh, devoid of any particular cell line, we might be able to suggest that it's related to that particular medication that's associated with that toxicity and then immune mediated. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Uh, the immune-mediated disorders can also be assessed uh, therein with oftentimes um, reactive changes. Um, and very importantly, and this is where I think it really affects all of you, is disease monitoring. Um, we, we want to know the diagnosis, of course, and getting the marrow helps us with that. But when you're put on a medication and all of a sudden your counts change or your symptoms change, as Dr. Mesa uh, pointed out, uh, one of the concerns we have is, is there progression of disease? And the only way to know that oftentimes is to do 
uh, a repeat bone marrow study. And so serial monitoring is something we oftentimes do for certain diseases. Um, but certainly if there's ever been a change in your status after a particular therapy or even after you're under a period of observation and all of a sudden you're feeling poorly or your labs change. So disease monitoring is, is very important and in point of fact, for most of the drugs that come to market, there is a requirement for frequent testing. Any of you who have been on a clinical trial will probably know firsthand uh, that you're probably getting marrows done more frequently than some of your friends who may have the same, uh, same disorder. But this is how we know if the drugs are working or if the drugs are potentially toxic. Um, so uh, those are some of the reasons uh, that we do the test. Um, I don't know if your physicians show you the tray, but this is sort of a prototypical tray. Um, I wouldn't want to see it if I were going through one, but, um, but they, they, it is what it is. Um, and uh, what you can see here are a, a variety of tools that the clinician is going to use to perform the procedure. Um, this is a coring needle up here, and so that helps us to get an actual piece of the bone. Uh, that's what we call the biopsy portion of the procedure. We're going to talk about that as well. But prior to moving on to the biopsy, we're going to talk about the aspirate. And the aspirates, is, it's got a smaller uh, needle on the end. Um, what you're seeing here is what we call a sternal guard. Um, some people undergo a procedure called a sternal aspirate. We don't do a biopsy from the sternum. Um, but there are times when we would do that procedure, and we'll talk about those, uh, those as well. Uh, and of course, very importantly, some numbing medication is uh, included in the tray. And I will tell you that most of us who do this use more than just this one little vial of of uh, lidocaine or xylocaine or whatever's in your kit. Uh, we uh, really do think it's important to numb uh, the patient very, very well, and I'll explain uh, why in, uh, in, in just a minute. Um, there are a lot of nerves there, and of course the slides as well, and then some specimen uh, collection uh, tubing. Uh, but that's our tray, um, essentially. And so here's the uh, procedure, and I want to talk a little bit about why we do the procedure, where we do the procedure. Um, and you can see this patient's on their side. Now, some, some of you may have had a bone marrow biopsy done um, in the prone position, lying flat on the table. Um, it just is really a function of how your clinician was trained to do the procedure. But the bottom line is we go here in the posterior iliac crest in an area located um, in the proximity of what we call the posterior iliac spine. And th the reason that we go there uh, is because it's very prominent in most people. It's very easy to feel, and if we have you wiggle just a little bit and bend over, we can really feel that bony prominence, and we can go, there's a, there's a, a fairly sizable area just below it uh, that is fairly flat. And in most people, fairly wide. So it's easy to, um, it's easy to access. More importantly uh, than ease of access is it's a safe place to do the procedure. Um, we're below the level of the spinal cord. We're away from vital organs. However, there are risks. There are a lot of nerves that course through here. I've had patients, uh, um, in particular, I had one young lady with myeloproliferative disease and the operator um, and, and had a risk of bleeding associated with, uh, with her counts. And uh, the operator decided to continue to go up for multiple efforts and eventually developed a big hematoma, which is a big collection of blood, uh, that, uh, that essentially led to significant damage around that nerve that lasted for years uh, before it started to fade. So there are some risks. And with that, I would say this. If you are the patient lying on the table and the, and the person doing the procedure has attempted two, three, four, five times, uh, you, you have the right to say stop. We were always trained, if you've done more than three passes at the most, and usually two, and you're getting nothing, take a break, try the other side, um, revisit this, but don't torture the patient because it's not completely uh, risk-free. But by and large, this is the safest area to go, and very importantly, it's where the money is. In adults, most of our bone marrow is made in the pelvis and in the, uh, in the femur, so it's a place where we can get a lot of cells uh, to analyze. And obviously, we don't want to call you back, the dreaded call back. We didn't get enough or we, you know, we didn't, we, the, the marrow was uh, non-diagnostic, please come back. And I am cognizant of the fact that patients with myeloproliferative disease will also have, uh, have, often have something called a dry tap uh, because of the scarring. Or there's just so many cells in there that we don't get enough out. Um, and, and so sometimes we might suggest another attempt. Uh, it does happen, but we want to minimize the risk of it. So there are a variety of reasons why we go in this area, uh, at least in, uh, in adults. However, uh, if we can't get a sample here for any reason, or perhaps you've had radiation to your pelvis for some reason, maybe you had a prior malignancy, 
uh, in that case, we might need to go elsewhere because we know the cells in that area might not be viable um, or we might not get an adequate sample. Um, so sometimes we do go elsewhere. Um, and uh, here is a, a sample of a clinician. Um, now, I usually uh, put a drape over and, and then I can fold it right at the level of the nose. Uh, and some patients uh, like to have their eyes on blinded. Other patients say, cover me up, uh, I don't like this at all. I'll tell you a very cute story. I had a, um, a, a fireman who was just a real husky kid, um, tough as nails kind of guy, uh, who needed uh, frequent sternal aspirates. <clears throat> had some damage to his pelvis in the past, and the, the architecture was just very difficult. And so he used to ask me to put the cover over him, and from the minute I took the needle and touched it to the center of his chest, he would scream. Uh, and literally at the top of his lungs to the point where everybody in the office would hear it uh, and then I would pull it out and he would go, ooh, that really wasn't that bad, thanks doc. <laughs> and uh, so it was just the anxiety of it. So we tried it with his eyes, oh, you know, uncovered, covered. Um, but uh, just the thought of this, I'm sure, uh, uh, will yield some anxiety. It certainly would uh, for me. Suffice it to say, the overwhelming majority of people who have to go through this, despite what it looks like, say it is much easier. Now, we don't routinely do this because we want both a biopsy, as you'll see in just a minute, and the aspirate, the so-called liquid, the pulp. They both have value. So the more information, uh, the more tissue, the better off it's going to be as it relates to your care. Um, <clears throat> however, sometimes we do it. And so when we do the sternal aspirate only, we, again, we don't want to do a biopsy. There's not enough tissue there to do a biopsy, and in point of fact, uh, doing that can be dangerous. We don't want to disrupt the sternum, and we certainly don't want to go into the center of the chest. So to, do, to avoid that, uh, we put a sternal guard on, um, and that sternal guard prevents a certain depth, uh, so we don't cause, uh, you know, do a heart biopsy instead. We don't, certainly don't want to do that. Um, but this is the procedure for the sternal aspirate. And again, it's a very superficial, um, in, in virtually every human being, you know, just touch the center of your chest. It's very easy to find. Um, and there are certain landmarks that we use that are also very easy to find. And there's good marrow there. So if it's the only way your doctor tells you they're going to get a sample, it's not an unreasonable thing uh, to do. And sometimes it's, uh, it's necessary. Now, as I mentioned, we do both a biopsy and an aspirate. And this is a picture of the aspirate. One of the most important things we teach our, our um, staff when they're learning how to do this is to not pull too much fluid. Um, when you pull too much fluid, what ends up happening is you dilute it with blood. Um, and that can really lead to misinformation. Uh, so really only about two cc's of fluid, uh, uh, one to two mLs, um, is about what we take for each sample. And we, so we do multiple pulls. now. For you, what does that mean? Multiple times you're feeling that intense pressure, uh, which is not comfortable. And unfortunately, the only way to avoid that pressure, because it usually means you're getting a good sample because you're in the right spot, uh, is to put you to sleep. And people often ask that the last talk, I think you probably recall, somebody said, you're inhumane, why don't you put everybody to sleep? And the reality is it's such a quick procedure that the risks of, 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 of anesthesia um, probably outweigh any benefit but there are exceptions to that too. Some people just need to have it, especially um, patients with severe myelofibrosis, where getting the sample can be very, very difficult. Um, so if patients need it, they need it, but by and large, I, I try to avoid um, anesthesia, which is an institutional thing, and, and I think, um, but, but sometimes, again, it's, it's, it's necessary, um, especially if it's mild sedation, um, and that's what we generally use when we do have to, to put uh, patients uh, to sleep for it. Um, or some patients will just take an Ativan before the procedure. Um, but we pull and we get that information and the aspirate gives us certain information. Now, as important as the pull and getting the right information, uh, getting the, the enough tissue, um, is how the technician lays them out on the slide. Um, you probably haven't seen, now we, we, we have the slides made right at the bedside. Other labs will send a tube and the slides will be made um, in the lab itself. Um, but we, we prepare them at, at the bedside and people should be trained how to do this correctly. You don't want to uh, uh, smudge them too hard and take the, the, the cytoplasm off and, or, or take the nucleus out of all the cells um, and, and leave the cells unintact because that's not helpful. Uh, and and uh, you also don't want to smear them too much to make it look too thin or too little to make it look like all the cells are stuck together. And then it's very hard to tell what those cells are and very importantly if those cells are atypical in appearance. And so not only do you have to be trained to do the procedure to get the fluid out, 
uh, but to lay it on the slides correctly. Um, it's not hard to learn, but it's something that comes with experience, um, and it's uh, it both, I, I find, are of equal uh, importance. So why do we do an aspirate and a biopsy? Well, let's talk first about the aspirate. The aspirate is the pulp, okay? Um, that's going to help us to do what's called a differential count. Um, you know, depending on the, on the pathologist, they might count anywhere from uh, 200 cells, uh, and some will count up to 500 cells. And it's very important in patients with myeloproliferative disease to know, is a certain cell line overrepresented or underrepresented? And importantly, are the immature parts of, this, of the bone marrow overrepresented, which means a higher risk, uh, risk disease? So we want to know that everything is there that should be and in the correct proportions. Um, we want to know that white blood cells are in the right proportion to red blood cells, something we call the ME ratio, and the best way to do that is to, um, uh, a smear, is to look at the aspirate uh, smear, very importantly. I mentioned morphology. Are the cells atypical? Some patients with myeloproliferative disease progress on to a more dysplastic course. There's this crossover between what we call myeloproliferative disease and myelodysplastic syndromes, MPN, uh, MP, MDS, uh, crossover type syndromes, um, which do exist. And looking at the morphology specifically, we know what a healthy, mature white blood cell should look like under the microscope, a neutrophil, versus one that is dysplastic or atypical in appearance. And I'm going to show you some of those here in, uh, in just a minute. We do some special stains. I'm going to show you those as well. The aspirate is also crucial for the bottom three here, which is going to be the crux of some of the program moving forward here today um, with, uh, with Dr. Gottlieb specifically talking about the molecular testing. Um, but flow cytometry, I'm going to talk about what that is, cytogenetic and fish testing, and then molecular analysis. All of these things have great diagnostic and prognostic value. They help us determine what you have, and they help us to determine the likelihood of it progressing, or as we mentioned before with disease monitoring, is it progressing? Um, and uh, and we, we use all of these things together. None of these things exist uh, in a vacuum. So this is an aspirate. This is looking underneath the, uh, under, under the microscope at a, a, a reasonably well-smeared area um, where the cells are generally uh, separated. And what you're seeing actually here are an abundance of red blood cells. This is from a, a patient with, um, with P. vera. Um, and what you're seeing down here is an abundance of white blood cells at various forms of maturation and hardly any red blood cells. And this is in a patient with CML, um, which is in a sense a myeloproliferative disease, but one that we sort of talk about separately um, for uh, for somewhat obvious reasons. The, the uh, disease course is very different and we have very specific therapies for it. Uh, suffice it to say, these are both abnormal. Um, and, and the only way to know that is to look at that aspirate and do a full count. <clears throat> So here are some megakaryocytes. These are atypical, hyperlobated, some are hypolobated, but these are the cells that um, are oftentimes overabundant in patients with ET um, and uh, ultimately produce excess numbers of platelets. So again, seeing how they look, do they look normal or not, um, and are they there in normal numbers or not is very uh, instrumental for us as it, makes, as it relates to making a diagnosis. I told you I would talk a little bit about iron. Um, because it's, it's sort of an age-old thing that and even today, you, you'd be surprised, somebody comes in with anemia and they're just automatically started on iron. Um, and in point of fact, as you well know, patients with MDS and MPN oftentimes have excess iron um, regardless. And so it's not necessarily the fact that they don't have iron that's making some of their blood counts abnormal, uh, but they're maybe not utilizing it correctly. One of the things that can also develop, of course, with patients with these groups of disorders as they become more anemic in some, um, in some uh, groups of disorders, especially myelofibrosis or, or any of the uh, secondary myelofibrotic patients can become profoundly anemic and end up with iron overload as a result of, of uh, frequent transfusions. That can be a problem because that's an insidious process that can start to damage organs later on. So knowing your iron status um, is, is, is important. We do monitor the blood, but that can, uh, as I suggested earlier, is not always predictive. So going to the marrow is one way that we can ensure a good sample, and we must do it from the aspirate. Um, if we do it, whoops, uh, if we do it from the biopsy, it's usually inaccurate as the process of preparing the biopsy chelates out the iron, and it might look like you have no iron when you may have an abundant iron, 
or less iron than you actually do. Um, so we, we tend to do iron stains there. I want to mention um, a, a cell we call the ring sideroblast because we're seeing more and more um, patients with ring sideroblasts and a variety of MPNs. Um, and these are uh, essentially iron-laden cells. The iron is not being utilized. Um, so as I suggested before, some patients with blood disorders uh, 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 have plenty of iron there, they just don't functionally use it. And that's one mechanism by which we're trying to um, improve outcomes in disease as well, looking at various um, therapies. Now this is um, a crude uh, picture of a flow cytometer, but essentially what we're doing here is shooting each individual cell through a laser, um, and depending on antigens on the surface of that cell, um, there's an amount of scatter that is demonstrated. And so what we might see is an excess number of white cells and in particular class, particularly blast, this is useful for. Um, but it also helps us to differentiate um, other, uh, uh, other cells that might be present. Um, oftentimes we see patients with coexisting disorders, you know, two, two different conditions. I have a handful of patients, and I'm sure my colleagues here do, um, uh, who have MPN with a coexisting uh, uh, lymphomatous process in the marrow and then determining which of the two is causing the change in blood counts um, can, can, generally speaking, uh, be best determined by flow cytometry. Um, is the blast count going up, as I suggested? The other thing that the flow cytometry helps us to do is look at the fingerprint of specific cells. And so sometimes we can see cells that are reactive in nature and other times cells that are what we call monotypic, meaning they've arisen from a specific clone. And the only way to know that is do they carry the same fingerprint that you had in the disease uh, previously. Flow cytometry reports, even when they're normal, are exceedingly complex. Um, the way that they're reported, we get all the time primary care physicians, and I would be exactly the same way, uh, reading these reports and going, I have absolutely no idea what this means. And it may all be completely normal. There's a lot of information there. Um, so flow cytometry is important. Re, uh, um, uh, doing routine karyotyping where we do a full chromosomal analysis of about 20 cells on average. Um, and you can see here um, a translocation involving chromosomes 9 and 22 where parts of one chromosome were switched with another resulting in a very specific disease we call CML um, or sometimes lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, so that can be helpful. But as you can imagine, if you're only looking at a small subset of cells when you do full chromosome, uh, analysis or karyotype, um, you can miss certain things because it's such a small population of cells that we're identifying. And I hope you'll get the gist as we go forward here, the idea that the, the newer tests are allowing us to do deeper and deeper and deeper investigation from one in 20 cells down to one in hundreds of thousands of cells. And so looking for that clonal abnormality um, uh, becomes very uh, uh, much easier in today's uh, day and age. And one of the mechanisms by which we can look at one in a few hundred cells, um, and I show you here um, uh, staining by a, a, a study called FISH, fluorescence in situ hybridization, where you're looking for specific abnormalities. And the technician who knows how to read uh, uh, the microscopy, as you can see here, can see certain abnormalities present or not. And that can look at a few hundred cells and then very importantly, and I throw this up here because I'm, I'm uh, you know, drinking from my own cistern as an AML doctor as well, I want to show you the complexity of where molecular testing has brought us today. With most of the diseases we treat, it's not just about diagnosis anymore. It's about prognosis and risk stratification. Almost everything we do is based on what is your individual risk. Is it low, intermediate, or high, and subdivisions Therein. Well, in point of fact, with our old testing, most patients fell into that middle category and could go either direction. And, and in point of fact, most of the risk stratification models that we had for the so-called intermediate risk group were 25% off in either direction. And so we've developed new models looking at molecular analysis. And again, Dr. Gottlieb is going to talk to you about this, um, I'm sure, in a much more eloquent way than I, um, that, that can look at all of these mutations to better determine where you fall, especially if you're in that middle group. And that becomes very important when we start talking about things like bone marrow transplant, which can have significant risk associated with it. Do you really need this? 
um, or not. And again, as Dr. Mesa suggested, there's a host of questions that go into, uh, uh, go into answering that final question, uh, but molecular analysis becomes uh, exceedingly important. Dr. Gottlieb already started in uh, uh, talking a little bit about specific mutations and how they impact myeloproliferative disease diagnostically, but we're also learning that they may have prognostic implication. Um, and so specifically, he mentioned, and, and I'm, he's going to go into it again, uh, I'm certain the uh, JAK2 mutation in the two varieties, the V617F and the exon 12, MPL and CalR mutations. Um, with the exception of P-Vera, um, you can have any one of these three in ET and PV. Um, in, in, in present in, in certain numbers or not. And then there's oftentimes those patients who are not mutated. And is there more information? Because these, this is a very, very difficult group of people to accurately diagnose. It requires all of the testing to make the diagnosis correctly. The last thing we want to do is label somebody with a myeloproliferative disease if they truly don't have one. And sometimes in the non-mutated patients, we have to use the word may, which as you can well imagine, will lead to psychological distress, especially if you're used to playing around on the internet, like I am late in the night. Um, so it's something uh, uh, I think is uh, difficult, and as long as you have a trustworthy physician there um, and, and, a, and a good relationship, um, don't be afraid to ask these, these questions. Now I want to talk briefly about the biopsy, because I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. Um, and the biopsy is here. It looks like a little worm. Um, it doesn't have to be that big, only about a centimeter or two. Um, and it gives us additional information. Cellularity, are there abnormal infiltrates, and some special stains done there as well. And as I alluded to earlier, the so-called dry tap. Sometimes we just have to get a chunk of bone and be satisfied because we just can't get fluid out, whether there's too many cells or there's too much scar tissue. So this is a normocellular marrow, and what you see is um, fat cells and cells. Um, so these fat, this, these areas of fat here, um, at, at about 50 years of age are half, um, uh, about half of the bone marrow space. When we're born, we hardly have any fat in our bone marrow, kind of like we do the rest of our bodies. You know, we're pretty, pretty lean uh, for the most part. As we get older, things start to plump up a little bit. They plump up in the marrow um, as well over the course of time. So in a 90-year-old, we would expect that about 10% of the marrow space is fat, plus or minus 10%. Um, I'm sorry, is, um, is cells, and the rest is fat. The majority gets replaced by fat. So really, a normal cellular marrow in a 90-year-old is about 10%, and the rest is fat. Um, in a 50-year-old with a 90% cellular marrow, that's usually a problem. That means something is happening. What is happening remains to be seen, uh, but in most patients with myeloproliferative disease, the marrow is hypercellular. It has too many cells, and that is something that is driven by age and best determined by the biopsy, why we like to have both uh, biopsy and aspirin. Here's a marrow that's 100% cells. This happens to be from somebody in their 70s, and you can see that's abnormal. They should have about 30% of those little holes, um, which represent fat globules. This is a special stain we do called reticulum. And there are different forms of fibrosis and special stains we can do, which are very frequently increased in patients with MPL, as you well know. Um, and that's one way of tracking disease as well, how much fibrosis is there. And you've probably seen your reports, one plus, two plus, et cetera. Um, it can be difficult to estimate, but nevertheless, progressive fibrosis is always a concern to us. And, um, and, and some of the ways we are monitoring certain drugs and even in bone marrow transplant is whether or not there's any uh, degradation of this scarring network. But this is scarring, much like it would be in any other damaged tissue. <clears throat> Special stains that we can do in the marrow to get a crude estimate as to the percentage of cells that might harbor a specific fingerprint. Um, and in this case here, I draw your attention to blast cells that are overabundant um, in a patient with, uh, with progressive disease. Um, so, I, I hope it's helped you. Um, I'll tell you what, the California fresh air has certainly helped me, and I again want to want to thank you all uh, for allowing me to come out. Um, I close with this slide. Um, I close with a, a essentially normal cellular marrow with normal numbers of megakaryocytes, normal numbers of white cells with normal maturation, normal looking red blood cells, et cetera. This is what we're all striving for. Every one of the clinicians here uh, who um, I must say are some of the best in the world, so I'm humbled by the fact that I'm on an agenda um, with them, um, are seeking this. You know, we can make symptoms better. We can make blood counts better. We're getting there. But God willing, someday we can get to this point where we can start to see the marrow get really healthy again. We may not, but it's worth striving for, I think.